Do you have Alcoholics Anonymous in Italy? Alcoholici Anonymi. Yeah, there is, right? I'm making up words. Eh? So there is? Yes. Right, I, have a, I have an idea for a new group, recovering from a good introduction group. <laughs> it's very hard to outlive uh, Marco's introduction of me. Like if I, if I levitated right now, I, you'd be like, yeah, sure, what's next? We want better. So it's very difficult to impress at this point. Uh, also, this is a kind of a particular emotional moment for me because I've never given a talk in Italy. Um, I, have no idea, I, I have no idea what you guys react to. I have, like, should I use my hands? What, you, what should, <laughs> what's the protocol here? And besides, this is not even a C++ talk. Um, I, I think Marco didn't know that, but, you know, he, you know living uh, dangerously. Um, I don't know how to give a keynote talk. This is a technical talk. It's a talk about algorithms. And um, not knowing how to give a keynote, I googled how to give a keynote. And they said, any keynote speaker, is this like my booming voice or is it like... You hear me? Is this... All right. So um, I read that the first thing that uh, a good keynote speaker must do is to establish credentials. Like they say, you know, any, you know, anybody in this room must be asking myself, well, is this guy kind of relevant? What's the, what's the deal with this guy? I can tell you the answer is no. <laughs> and I actually have two pieces of evidence. Exhibit one. Uh, this guy, like, it looks like this guy has a back, backache. He's kind of diffi has difficulty walking. And this was the first sign I saw arriving in the United States of America. Literally, I, I go out of JFK and this is the first thing it's a bit. And years later I found out that this is pedestrian crossing. It's a sort of a play on words, right? So I have this amazing device here. So pedestrian crossing, you know, Xing, right? X being the cross and crossing. So of course, not like 80% of my English vocabulary at the time were like the C++ keywords. So, you know, whenever I shout for a sound, I will try to, well, true, continue, <laughs> while, yeah, break, 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 that kind of stuff. So anyway, so I, I see the sign, and this is a true story. Both are true stories. I'm not kidding, I'm even exaggerating. So I, saw, I see the sign, and I'm seeing these words, and they did not look like English. They, it's not, this is not English, and it's ped sing. And my, so my problem is that I need to have a theory about everything there is. So, I, you know, a normal person would see that sign and would well, it must be some crosswalk or something, you know, for pedestrians, for people to walk. And, uh, you know, but no, my hypothesis was the following. Wow, Americans are very nice to Chinese immigrants. <laughs> And I built a whole scenario in my mind, which went the following. It was like, the Chinese immigrant comes to America, New York, lands in New York. They're like, whoa, New York, this is awesome. So they try to cross the street, the car runs over them. <laughs> so they put that sign, right? And that's Chinese, because in my stupid mind, I did not realize that Chinese has a different alphabet to start with. <laughs> so a Chinese guy would not be held by, even if that meant whatever, right? So this was my theory like for, for a good while. I had no idea that that's not Chinese. Exhibit number two, on my first Monday at work, so I go, I worked, like, I worked on Wall Street. My first job in America was Wall Street. Uh, so I go on Wall Street and they say, well, you know, you gotta do like the beta weighted uh, index uh, to SPX, you know. Whoa, hold on there, professor. What, what do you mean? They say, oh, you know nothing about the stock market. I said, no, nothing at all. I was like, what wine goes with it? I had no idea. Right, so, well, so with time I kind of started to learn a bit and uh, I, I figured like th there's the Dao, you know, the Dao. You know, the Dao, you know, the Dao is like a moody child, like the Dao is down today and the Dao is like, you know, has a problem today and the Dao today is not good or is good, the Dao is in a good mood today, and that kind of stuff. So, you know, love the Dao, right? So then I learned about S&P 500. So I asked the guy like, you know, what does S&P 500 mean? And he said, oh, it's standard and poor index. That's oh, interesting. So, okay, so what, uh, you know, what's the, what's the DAO? 
He said the DAO is the, are the biggest 30 companies in America. Right? Which is, I thought, oh, that's very nice. It's something I can work with. The DAO, awesome. The biggest 30. So then our discussion kind of interrupted, so I never found out what this guy means, Standard & Poor's 500 index. And I had to build a hypothesis. And a normal person would go to Google, but that was 1998. It was not a reflex at the time. Right? It was not like, oh, whatever you don't know, just Google for it and you're good. No, it, I was like this. I got to build a hypothesis in my mind with no data. Right? Using just my mind. And I thought, the DAO is the biggest 30 companies in the US. And then the next 500 the standard ones and the poor ones. <laughs> like the so-so ones and the poor ones, that do, those come next. So I'm not kidding. This, so there is still code at NASDAQ work, right, written by a guy who operated under this hypothesis the whole time. Like, yeah, those are the you know, 500 companies that follow the standard ones and the poor ones. So it turns out poor is a guy. His name was Poor. <laughs> and he built his own company. And I understand the guy. I mean, you can't get a job if you're named, like, in, in, like, as a money guy. You know, we have this applicant here, and his name is Poor. <laughs> Poor. Jim, you gotta, you gotta see this, man. We have an applicant here, and his name is, he wants to be financial analyst. He wants to work with money. And his name is Poor. <laughs> right? So that was the, that's the second exhibit. So I hope by this time I lowered the expectations back to where they should be. So let's talk a bit about, let us get into like the, you know, the, the mood of things. <coughs> oh, by the way, Moody, you know what Moody is? It's a rating agency. They, it's all like poor and moody and like, you know, the Wall Street like, has a lot of humor actually. It's pretty cool. All right, so uh, trends in fast computing. So here's what I gathered, and from where I am, I'm kind of noticing a few things over the years. And uh, one thing that I noticed is that pointers are becoming less popular. They're, you know, they're not getting much uh, advertising anymore. No, the advertising money goes elsewhere. We'll figure out the next slide where, but you know, here's my, like when you crack open any book, the classic books on algorithms and data structures, it's all pointers, like, oh, we have trees. It's awesome, you know, you know, follow left, follow right, and you have a binary tree, and this is amazing. And nowadays, uh, I noticed you know, in real applications, a eh, few people like go with like this pointer chasing kind of uh, uh, business, right? I noticed that trees are getting flatter by the year. Flatter and kind of vertically challenged and kind of thick, right? Like people, right? <laughs> Like in way, way back when, there's a, a whole cottage industry of binary trees. Binary trees, are, you know, random binary trees, and you know, partially sloppy binary trees, and all kind of like, oh, again, humorous definitions of binary trees. And then like the red black trees, that's not racist at all. And then like two, three finger trees, so they, they come with the best names, don't they? It's amazing. And uh, sort of like the, the prima donna right now, oh, I mean Italy, la prima donna, right? is uh, the big map vector try. And even hash tables don't do lists anymore. They use uh, what's called open addressing, so they just use an array, and they kind of mess with the array. Um, so, you know, people just don't like pointers anymore. What do they like? They like arrays. That's if it's for, oh, that's a nice sound too. <laughs> All right, if it's for me, I'm busy. Um, so I noticed that uh, nowadays, and not in books yet, but more in like research papers, arrays plus plus are kind of hot. And arrays plus plus meaning you start with an array and you build some structure on top of the array with minimum, you know, addenda, right? And then you use that as a smart data structure. The simplest, and you know, essentially there's a whole domain right now that's uh, only the ten, past 10 years it started. It's called implicit data structures. And implicit data structure means it's, uh, the, the structure of the data is not explicit 
meaning it's not in pointers and relationships among pieces of data. So it's, you can't see from the topology what the structure is. But it's implicit in the sense that you have an array and the structure is in your mind. Like it's implicit. It's kind of, you know it's there, but it's, it's not explicit. Um, Bitmap vector tries, by the way, are like, they're arrays, pretty much. Like, and they kind of uh, make themselves believe that it's actually a tree, but it's like an array because each, each level has like 64, like it's an array of 64 elements. And if you have more than 64, you kind of go one level down. And it's powers of two, so the maximum number of levels you can ever have is like eight. So it's eight levels of array stacked on top of each other. That's pretty much what this guy is. A wonderful data structure. Uh, makes functional people happy, makes computer happy because it's, a, it's arrays, not pointers, and so on, right? So anyway, um, who has an example of an implicit data structure built on top of an array that is an absolute classic? It is in the STL, it's in every computer book. Yes, please, with the beard and the glasses, thank you. You don't have any, you don't have beard and no glasses. You, like, you're ahead of the guy with... Heap, thank you very much. The binary heap. It's an implicit data structure. It's built on an array. And it just turns out that there's a, a certain relationship between the elements of that array that's being established and maintained. And you use that kind of cleverly, right? Uh, very interesting. This is good stuff. Also, like, uh, I noticed this tendency that, you know, whenever there's a small, you know, whenever there's not a lot of data, the array is kind of the perfect data structure. Because everything is all of one when you're small. Right? So people say, oh, so if it's a small, if it's small, I'm just gonna hold it in array. And if I do kind of a quadratic whatever, it's still gonna be all of one. Because it's small. Right? So the small array is in a way the perfect data structure, right? And interesting with uh, computer power and, and all, the definition of what's small grows over time, right? So back in the day, it was like, I don't know, three elements. And I remember like to this day that, the, um, uh, you know the flat, uh, boost flat map? Boost flat map. It's a sorted array that they do binary search in and it behaves kind of like a map, right? You can't insert easily into it, but you know, it behaves kind of like a map for searching. So I remember to this day, uh, back in the early 2000s, you could not beat the pointer chasing map with a flat map. And it just turned like, I think uh, it was a uh, year 2004, it all kind of turned around. So, okay, um, interesting. And I also noticed uh, a very interesting uh, trend, which is throughput is solved, latency is not solved. Low latency is kind of a niche thing. You know, have you heard of like low latency software? Low latency trading, right? Low latency trading. It's, oh, I have like this, uh, the, the signal comes at the unexpected. So the signal, the more unexpected it is, the more money you're gonna make. So the signal comes, it's unexpected, you gotta re respond to it real quick. And what I'm saying is that it's, it's a, 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 a single event, it's not sort of a, a stream of events that are kind of all expected. And it's just, you know, particular events you gotta respond real quick and that's low latency. There's no notion of high throughput computing. Nobody says, oh yeah, I'm working in the domain of high throughput computing. Why not? Everybody does. Yeah, because it's the default, it's implicit. If you wish, yeah, of course, uh, high throughput is the name of the game. Everybody's doing that. So there's no, you know, there's low latency computing but not high throughput. So, um, that's, uh, that has consequences, and uh, kind of we're starting to get into something interesting here because um, what people optimize for are code that is repetitive, has good code locality, is unsurprising because speculation and prefetching work for that kind of pattern, and is arithmetic intensive because that scales well, we have uh, solved in uh, since uh, I think 2000. Also, 2004, it turns out, uh, there's a paper on how to make an, a 64-bit addition in one cycle, which was sort of a research project before that. 
And ever since, everybody is implementing like, you know, addition in one cycle on 64 bits. So arithmetic is sort of a, you know, a solved problem from a hardware standpoint. They just go with it and you can scale it properly. So given this um, milieu, we have the surprising realization that computers like boring things. They like to not be surprised. They have their routine, or quite, quite literally, they like routine. Yes, they like loops, they like predictable things, they like to prefetch, they like to speculate, they like everything to be expected. To wit, you know, essentially to break with my past of like, you know, pet sing, pet sing and standard and poor 500, I ran some measurements to figure that out. So uh, this is a very interesting conclusion because, you know, nobody designs algorithms, I'm not nobody, but not kind of the classic algorithms are not designed that way. You know, so, you know, right now you can think like linear scan is fast and random access is slow. So maybe optimize for that kind of access pattern. And the, the more interesting um, realization here is you want to prefer low entropy ifs to high entropy ifs. And when I say entropy, I say informational entropy. Right? Not the kind of heats the CPU and makes the entropy, increase the entropy in the universe by heating, you know, destroying the planet. No, I'm talking about informational entropy. So the more surprising an if is, the less efficient it is. And this is like totally counterintuitive. It's like it runs against, because what we want intuitively as programmers is to extract as much information as possible from an if. We don't want to spend that if easily, right? We want to say, oh, I put this if here, it better be good, <laughs> right? It better get me some good information right now. This is that, like the intuition of like, you know, minimum expenditure, ma maximum effect kind of if goes ex exactly contrary to what's good for the CPU. This is completely weird. I gotta, I gotta emphasize just how bizarre the situation is, ladies and gentlemen. Right? So, okay, fine. <clears throat> and now we have like this uh, odd situation. Now I think it's going to be fixed in 10 years. I always like to talk about like what's going to be in 10 years because in 10 years I'm going to be retired. I won't care. Right? I'll be like, fine. Yeah, it didn't happen, but you know, I'm done here. I collect my pension. And, um, but right now in research, there's this notion of cash oblivious algorithms that only now is coming to. Um, it's starting to represent realities in computing that are not only like, uh, you know, if is like a test and jump and branch and a simple model of the computer. So you have new, new domains in, uh, in um, research on efficiency that are kind of ahead and broken, you know, kind of just divergent from the mainstream uh, literature. So I'm going to talk about sorting. Who knows sorting? Quick sort. Who knows quick sort? All right. Now here's the thing. Here's what I, who implemented sort? Like in their lifetime, like when you were a student. I, you know, I don't care. Whenever, right? Who implemented sort once in their lifetime? All right. Who knows? Who knows prelude in C major for Anna Maria Bach, Magdalena Bach by Johann Sebastian Bach? One guy. Thank you. So if you, there's the pre, uh, do major, do, do maggiore, right? You're, I, you have no excuse. This is Italy. You're musical people. <laughs> you have no excuse, right? If you play any instrument, you got to play that, you know, prelude number one, C major by Bach, do mi sol do mi. I'm not going to sing for you because this is a respectable conference after all. <laughs> so I'm going to spare you. All right? But it's like the simplest prelude you hear it all, you know, all the time on radio and whatever. If you play the cello, the classical guitar, if you play the piano, if you play the tuba, you gotta play that at some point. And by analogy, if you're a computer person, you gotta implement sort once in your lifetime. Please do so. This is your homework, okay? I'm not kidding. So it's the most, it's, if you look like there's been so many papers on it, it's just like, amazing, the most research, the most used probably, 
uh, many algorithms just avail themselves of sorting as if, it, if it's a solved uh, problem. So of course, um, it's a very interesting uh, topic. So again, everybody of you should implement sort. You're musical people, you don't have any excuse. So uh, in the domain of sorting, we have quick sort. And quick sort is like, you know, every, everybody who's like implementing a sorting li library is gonna have quick sort as a kind of representative algorithm. Very easy to code, easy to analyze. You can, it's so simple, it's a five-liner. And depending on the language, it can be like a one-liner. <clears throat> and it's fast on average, it just works. It's just an amazing algorithm. I think like uh, Hor, just like the kind of strike of genius, just, you know, implement like a quick sort, quick select, and we have them. It's amazing. I was like, you know, if I could return in time, I go like one year ahead of that guy, like, you know, oh, here, here's an algorithm. Now I'll call it Andre sort. <laughs> you know, forget quick sort, right? So it's very nice, and it uh, has kind of some uh, interesting subtleties about it, uh, such as uh, little work on almost sorted data. And uh, by this, I'm underlying a principle in efficiency, which is idempotence should be cheap. Idempotence meaning you sort the data that happens to be already sorted. Right, so that should be cheap. You should move no elements. And that's a, it's, a, it's a core principle in efficiency. You want to, like, the no op should be really no op. Make, when the project has been made, should touch no files. You see what I'm saying, right? Make sense? That kind of stuff. So this is kind of a core principle. And it, amazingly, it's not always respected. Who can tell me an algorithm that always touches data, even if it's sorted? Another sorting algorithm that's famous. It's in all books. And the first thing it does is going to move data. Heap sort. Heap sort goes like this. I know the largest element must be at the end. Actually, let me show. Must be at the end. The largest element must be at the end. So I better put it at the beginning. I, the laughter br brought down the house here. Like, it's amazing. <laughs> My joke really worked. I'm telling you, I don't know how to speak. So, the largest element keeps on, it puts it at the, the beginning. And then it does the whole dribble down thing and it puts it back where it should be. So heaps are like, it's amazing. It's an average case, worst case, and best case. They're all the same. <laughs> like, it's like equal opportunity. There's no, like the most, the best algorithm there is, right? So, you know, yeah, item points should be cheap. Um, it's cash friendly or large, large input. It has, uh, it, it has a lot of good balance about it. And the naive implementation of quicksort I put a loop in there, so, um, ooh, wrong button, sorry about that. Okay, so we have a naive implementation of quick sort and it goes like this, while last minus first is greater than one because one element is already sorted, I'm going to do a partitioning of the array depending on some pivot, what's uh, greater goes here, what's smaller goes here, and then I'm going to recurse on both sides. And I re replaced one recursion with iteration with the while loop. Actually, you could say if instead of while and do two recursive steps, right? But we are C++ programmers, so whenever we can transform a recursion into an iteration, we're going to do it. Yes? And actually, I, I like this form. I, I don't mind it at all. So fine. So quick sorting is nice, and uh, it has trouble with very small inputs. So a less naive implementation would have a very important hyperparameter, which is called threshold. So this threshold thing here <coughs> tells me that when the array becomes too small, says, you know, I'm going to divide the array and sort the, the subarrays and everything. At some point, I'm going to have like two small arrays to quick sort, and for small there's a number of better algorithms that are bad for large inputs, but they're very good for small inputs. So what I did was I'm going to uh, do the looperoo until uh, you know, I have a greater than threshold. And at the end of the looperoo here, here this brace uh, right here, the closing brace, I'm going to have the array in an interesting state, which is going to be a bunch of small unsorted arrays, but on, on the overall the arrays themselves are in the right place. Right? So then I'm going to have a routine that's called small sort 
to be discovered, right? <coughs> and threshold is actually some number like this, chosen empirically, like, I don't know, 15 years ago and not ever visited since, right? So actually, I, I brought um, uh, STL, Stefan T. Lavave, and I was like, you know, what's the threshold for a visual studio? And he said, it's 32. And GNU has 16, so actually it's 16 or 32. I, you know, it's not a range. It's 16 or 32, depending on your implementation. Um, fine. So far, so good. So now, the challenge is, well, QuickSort is good. And, you know, there's a lot of research going into, like, you know, making it introspective and uh, making it, like, efficient and make sure it doesn't have, like, degenerate cases. And they told me I'm going to have a whiteboard. Marco, where are you? Marco? Is that, I'm going to, I swear to God, I'm going to write on that door right now. Ah, this is the blackboard. Ah, okay, blackboard. All right. I have a... Uh, Good stuff. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, I forgot what I, what I meant to write, but now I have this. All right. So the usual implementation of uh, small sorting algorithms goes like this. So I have like a small array. Do you see my awesome drawing here? Is somebody taking a photo? Like, that's going to be for the trial, for, you know, for this guy's <laughs> trial. Your Honor, he uh, gave a terrible keynote. All right, so um, the way insertion sort works, so, you know, you look at the implementation. You look at the STL implemented by a variety of people. You look at the classic uh, sorting implementations. The tested and true. And the tested and true for small arrays, they go with insertion sort, which goes the following way. Start from the left position, and your strategies, you're going to keep at all points a sorted portion, and this is unsorted yet. And each element here, you're going to find its position in the sorted array, and you're going to insert it by kind of moving things around. Not a very efficient algorithm for large inputs, because whenever you move things around, you're going to kind of have make room and stuff, right? Not very pleasant. Quadratic. So for every element, I'm going to do a linear search and a linear insertion for each element. So there's a loop, so quadratic, boom. However, it turns out it works pretty neat for small inputs because, you know, for small inputs, log is large and square is small and that kind of stuff. <coughs> Fine. Uh, better yet, I noticed that um, for small inputs, for really small inputs, like under 15 elements, there are perfect algorithms, handwritten. Like the sequences of moves and comparison swaps and moves that actually are optimal. They are known to be optimal. And Knuth's book has a few, and there's been research, and it's like up to 15 elements, we, we know how to do them. The problem being, why would, I, I, I didn't see them in a STL implementation. Why do you think so? The code size of those brute force implementations is large. And it turns out that the instruction cache is a valuable com commodity in a CPU, in a, you know, in, a, in a computing system, right? So it turns out, you have, yeah, you have, yeah, sure, I can sort 15 elements for it takes one megabyte of code to do so. <laughs> but what's one megabyte between friends? Well, so it turns out it's actually better to just use insertion sort for input small and kind of up to whatever th a threshold they have, and it's just going to be simple and easy. Remember, computers love boring. So um, interesting. So now the most difficult problem we have, and which I think is where a lot of research should be going and is going, is medium inputs. How do you sort a thousand elements fast? Well, quick sort is not very good for that kind of size. Insertion sort is terrible for that kind of size. So, you know, where does that leave us? So this is the problem I set out to look at. So let's take a look. Uh, we talked about this. And, you know, I have some math here. Don't get scared. Uh, this would be the formula for um, worst case comparisons and swaps. 
So it's n, n, by, n minus 1 by 2, and the average is half that, so n, n minus 1 by 4. So it means on average, if your threshold is 32, you're going to make 248 comparisons. You have uh, 32 elements to sort, which is quite a bit, right? But it turns out it's pretty fast. So uh, my first thought was, why not binary insertion sort? And binary insertion sort goes the same as insertion sort, except whenever it looks for the position of the new element to be inserted, it's going to do binary search instead of a linear search. I thought, these people like GNU and Microsoft, they're kind of silly. I know better. I know what to do. I'm just going to do the binary search. Nobody thought of that, of course. Nobody ever thought of that, so I'm going to be better. Wow, that's an easy path to success, isn't it? So, you know, I kind of run the math. I looked at the math, and uh, it was awesome. Look at this. Like, uh, for 32, it's uh, 155, so we're doing way better in terms of number of comparisons. Swaps stay the same. The swaps are the same because you're doing the same number. You know, it's, the swapping part of the strategy remains unchanged. Right? Very nice. <clears throat> so I sat down and implemented the best binary insertion sort there is, and I got excellent results. On one million random doubles with threshold 32, we got STD sort with 25 million comparisons, and with binary insertion, we got quite a few less, 22 million. So looking at a 15% reduction, this can't be worse. Right? So I improved on a key metric of sorting. It can't go worse. Right? Uh, by the way, why did I choose one million? One million. For two reasons. One, it sounds cool. One million, right? You feel like one million bucks or euros, right? But not lire, right? Lire, like one million lire was like nothing, right? It's terrible. But one million euros is like cool. Yeah, I feel like that, yeah. So um, one million is good because if you want to divide, you know, you want to compute the, you know, per element, you're going to divide by one million, which is easy. So you have like 25 comparison per element, right? And you can, people in Sony, they divide by n log n. <clears throat> n log of one million is 20. So you divide by 20 uh, million to get like uh, divide by, you know, n log n. So you get the ratios easily. <clears throat> So now, with uh, binary essentials, we, we get a net reduction, very significant in number of comparisons, same number of moves. You just instrument the code, and you, you get that. And now, let's look at the speed. It turns out the speed is an awful pessimization. So then we reduced a key metric of sorting, and that was a net pessimization of 13%. How do you explain that? Yes, please. The, the guys in the last row always have the cash. best cash. No. Branch prediction. Branch prediction. So it turns out that when you do a binary insertion sort, you're going to remember in the beginning, you're going to extract from each comparison, you're going to extract by definition the maximum amount of information because you know it's the log. You get a bit of information. You get a bit of the result with each if. Right? And with linear search, you're like an idiot. You go like, you know what? I'm just going to look through. I'm going to visit every neighborhood bar. And I'm going to have a beer there. That's the algorithm. Right? Until I get home. That's the algorithm. I'm not kidding. This is like the scientific description. I'm not sure you're familiar with it. It's just go. So this is kind of an idiot uh, way to go about it, but the average success rate of such a, so, you know, you, you fail once when you go home to the wife or the, you know, the husband, that's not, that's, that's your failure. But, you know, everything else, all the beers are successes, right? So essentially, you're gonna, your comparison is going to fail once for every search, which means an average success rate of 80, like almost 90%. And, you know, the branch predict is going to be like, yeah, come to, come to mama, right? <laughs> so, awesome. With this other guy, it's like, like scientifically proven 50% fail rate on random data, on random inputs, that is, of course. <clears throat> so, not good, right? So, branch prediction can do nothing for us. 
So that was kind of a bad lesson for me to learn. It was like, okay, here's the thing. I take the book, I tell the algorithm, I take the metrics that people want me to improve on, I improve them, friends, I improve, it's there, it's there. I have the measurements, I, you know, in counts, I'm good. If only speed were measured in counts. <laughs> I'm good with the counts, but it turns out I'm doing worse in reality. So that's kind of a, a deep reaching kind of thing, right? Very unpleasant. All research minimize comparisons. All books minimize comparisons. Reality, don't minimize comparisons. You're an idiot. Don't do that. So, whoa. OK. Very unpleasant. However, I should uh, tell you that I did some, uh, some search on, on that. And it turns out there's other um, papers written by, or in this case, it's just an article. Uh, written by people who go like, well, actually, it's not like that. So he did some research on some specific case of searching, which goes, well, uh, if it's powers of two and it's kind of, you know, if with wind from behind, it turns out that binary search is better. But all he did was binary search, not binary search and insertion. It turns out if you do something else in addition to binary search, the dynamics change completely. I'm just saying it's not easy. It's not simple, right? Fine. Ideas. I'm not kidding. So I'm, I, I expect from you in 30 seconds to like, destroy all the research that's ever been done. Come with a great idea. All right. So after a few weeks of thinking, I got to the following awesome idea, which is the following. I call it middle out insertion sort. I thought the following, you know, I want an algorithm that is some sort of a predictable, boring, but a bit smarter. But not too much smart, because then it's too smart and it's not predictable anymore. So I want it to be like, in those, you know, the, those dating sites? I want a guy who's strong, but also sensitive, right? <laughs> uh, I want somebody smart who's also boring, like an accountant who's like kind of funny, you know, some combination that's unlikely, right? So I, I want an algorithm that is smart but also boring, right? <clears throat> so my smart but also boring algorithm attempt was the following. I start from the middle and I go like this simultaneously in both directions. So my sorted portion of the array is going to be in the middle and I insert from the sides. And there's a few nice things about this. First of all, like I'm still doing linear search, but I'm doing fewer swaps and here's why. Whenever I insert two new elements. Whenever I insert two new elements, if this guy is smaller than this guy, I swap them first. So then I'm, I'm guaranteed to kind of have a, a little less to work from here and a little less to work from there. So I'm going, because the portion in the middle is going to stay put, not going to be changed. So that's kind of a nice thing. And I said I implemented the thing. And let me illustrate one pattern here because I want to, I want to uh, be very clear on one important universal pattern in uh, contemporary computing, which is the following. Notice this, auto write equals first plus one plus size and one. Normally, people would write code like, you know, auto write equals first plus one, semicolon if size and one, plus plus right, right? There will be an initialization followed by an if, or a question mark, or that kind of stuff, an if, a decision, a jump. But here what I'm doing is I integrate the notion that the size is even or odd within the arithmetic. And the more you can do that, the fewer jumps you're going, the fewer branch you, your code is gonna do. So this is a very valuable tip, whatever you do. Whenever you're in a, your inner loops, what you want to do is do logic as part of the arithmetic, not as part of the ifs. We're gonna have a few more of these later, okay? So, okay, so I'm going to uh, start from here, and depending on, uh, you know, if it's uh, an odd number of elements or an even number of elements, it's a bit different. 
and then I go like that. And the nice thing you notice is unguarded. Who can tell us why unguarded linear insert? Unguarded means I don't check for bound, bounds at all. I just go like boom and boom. Why, do I, why don't I need to bounce check? Yes, please. Thank you. I sort already, so I know that if I go this, I sort, so. I know beforehand that A is less than B. The limit here is less than the limit here because that's my first step in the algorithm. Look at it. If first, greater than right, right? The first uh, line in the loop, right? So I make sure that this guy is less than this guy. So when I, whenever I said this guy, I don't care for bounds because it's going to stop anyway. And this guy is also going to stop anyway. So that's going to save me a little. Not a lot, but a little. Uh, you know, one problem has to have. on guard a linear insert. Very nice. So I mean, looks good? Looking good? A good algorithm looks good, right? So it's supposed to run really nice. By the way, this is not very original. You should know that we're not breaking ground here, really. There's a whole garden variety of insertion sort variants, like two at a time, and library sort, and whatnot. And can, uh, it's all on Wikipedia. I didn't find this particular one, but I'm sure there's like 10,000 undergraduate students in India who've done it. OK? For sure. So let's take a look. And we have uh, an improvement in comparisons. We have a com an improvement in moves. And we have a pessimism. You have like no gain. Like time is identical. And it's like you look like, am I testing the right thing here? So it's, you couldn't believe your eyes. You look at all the metrics go the right way. It's only the time that doesn't go the right way. So by the way, this was my talk until a week ago. Like this would be the end of it. I would report this negative result and say, well, it didn't work. Homework. Do better. <laughs> but after weeks and weeks of like walking my underwear, like scaring my wife and kids in the house, like pulling my hair, like, oh my God, I have no talk for this conference. What am I going to do? I have, no, I have no material, no results, no meaning to anything I'm doing. Like this is my life until a week ago, okay? <laughs> Right? I was like on the you know, desperado state, okay? completely, de you know, completely destroyed. So, and here, here was, this was like the one spark that was good, friends. And it goes the following way. We have done the right things and we got the wrong results. <coughs> How about we do the wrong things I'm not kidding, and maybe we'll get good results. Because my main advantage at that point was that I was, one, desperate. I had no material. Like, this talk would be boring up until now. You got to admit. Like, yeah, OK, so this guy didn't walk on water. He got this great introduction. Like, look at him. He has, like, negative results to share, right? So. And I thought, you know, let me try something stupid. See what happens. Because I tried all the right things, and I have like everything looks like all the numbers look good, except the time. So maybe if I do something completely stupid, that's going to make worse. The comparison is going to make worse for the swaps. But maybe I'm going to do something uh, pretty awesome. And this is the idea going the other way. So this is sort of the meta idea. And I suggest you try that. In your, whenever you do optimization, you got to try a few crazy ideas. Right? Fine. Let's try some silly things. And it starts with a shower thought. Worst case for insertion is whenever you need, you know, whenever you insert, the worst case is when you go all the way to the beginning and you do an insertion, right? Because that's going to move the most elements. That's the worst case. When you move elements, if the last element in the insertion sort happens to be the smallest, that's the worst case because you've got to swap, you know, you got to just swap everything. Right? So that's the worst thing, moving elements over large distances is my unpleasant. So how about I do something completely nuts, and I go with, uh, I make a heap. Ugh. Come on. All right, this doesn't work anymore. Ah, there you go. Oh, wow, the latency. Look. <laughs> 
Okay, well, point made. Right? <laughs> Actually, this is worth the talk alone, right? It, this, is, this makes for the introduction. All right, so make heap, again, with the latency. All right. Anyhow, you're seeing make heap. So make heap is going to organize our uh, array, our small array, into a min heap. It's greater, but it's a min heap. A min heap has the following quality. And I'm going to actually uh, refer it to Wikipedia. All right. This is a min heap. A min heap has the following property. Uh, the parent is smaller than everybody below the parent. So in this case, we have a, a min heap that has one, which is the minimum element at the top, and then we have two and three, and then kind of greater than two, and you know, notice that for any element, whatever is below it as a descendant is going to be greater. And actually, the way you store a heap into an array is the first element counts at the, you know, the, the, uh, the root counts at the first element, the next two are the next two children, and the next four are the next four children. So you read it level by level. 1, 2, 3, 17, 19, 36, 7, 25, 100. And that's my main, uh, that's my uh, main heap in an array. And make heap does exactly this. Note that the array is not sorted. It's much weaker than sorted. It's not so one, two, three, the beginning looks good. But then we have like 17, 19, 36, 7, 7. What's with that 7 there, right? So it's not sorted. It's very weakly sorted. For each element, there's a log n elements that are smaller than it, right? The parents, the, the ancestors. So it's not a terribly sorted kind of state of affairs, but it has the following nice quality. The smallest counts at the top, so I'll never move it from, you know, it's not, the worst case, I got rid of it. I don't need to move the smallest element, kind of swap it all the way back when I do that. So interesting, uh, how about I make a heap and then I just, Without, with no regard for the heap structure, I'm just going to do insertion sort on top of the heap. And let me, um, <clears throat> let me explain again just how stupid this is. The heap is an intricate data structure, has properties, has like, you know, log and insertion and has log and, you know, removal of the minimum. It has a lot of like wonderful properties. No, we don't care. We just make the heap and then we, with no regard for the fact that it's a heap, we're just going to do insertion sort. But the nice thing is that I can make it unguarded. Why? Why is it unguarded? I don't need to do bounce checks when it's doing insertion sort. Why? Thank you very much. Because the smallest element is already in the top of in the, in the index zero. So I know that I'm not, never going to go past the smallest element. Right, so it's unguarded. So this is my only, the only advantage that I have by it being a heap is that it's unguarded. And believe me, that's like 1%. It's like nothing, right? So, um, all right. And by the way, why do I have begin plus two here, anyone? Thoughts? Begin plus two and not begin and. Begin plus two and. Begin plus two. So I starting from with a third, please. Yes. Thank you very much. That's right. So we know that the first element is the smallest. Must be the distance. All right. We know that the first element, ah, there you go. OK. We know that this one here is the smallest. It's at the left side of the array already. So you can consider that the first and the second are already sorted. They're a small sorted array of two elements. So I'm going to start inserting from the third on, right? All right. <clears throat> so if you uh, look at the sorting algorithms literature, you're going to find an algorithm called smooth sort, which is not very successful because it's very complicated. But it kind of does the right thing. It builds the heaps, and it kind of does it nicely and everything. It does a minimal amount of... Uh, of work and that kind of stuff. So like smooth sort, which is really smart, but this is stupid, right? So we're going to have, uh, hopefully, uh, a fewer swaps. All right. 
So I wrote uh, an acquaintance of mine who is a mathematician, a very good, very good mathematician, very good with optimization. So how about we build a heap sort? You, know, you make a heap and then you, you just do insertion sort. And it's funny that the guy did not understand what I meant. Because it was like so stupid, he kind of eliminated from the search space. <laughs> right? It was not in his, on his radar, it was this stupid. He, you know. So I, I don't understand what you're proposing here. And I said, well, you make a heap, and then on top of the heap, you just run plain insertion sort. And that, this is his whole email. The entire email was this. And that, like, that was last year. So I gave up on that. So I gave up on that, and I forgot all about it. And you know, he said, oh, well, yuck. This is a terrible idea. So then, uh, being desperate, a week ago, I kind of rediscovered this, uh, this notion, and I tried it. And I was very impressed. We're going to have 9% um, fewer comparisons and a whopping 20% fewer swaps, as I hoped. And of course, it was slower. <laughs> so I still have negative results to report, ladies and gentlemen. But here's my view on it. Uh, we're doing, in addition from the comparisons and all, the, all of the good stuff, we're doing too many <coughs> smart things like heaping, you know, making a heap and stuff. So I thought between me and this faster algorithm is make heap. So we need to make, make heap the fastest make heap in the world. Easy. I gotta, I'm not kidding. We got to find an implementation of make heap that's going to be faster than the fastest in the world. And you know what? We can do it. I'm not kidding. Today, you and I together can do it. So, uh, of course, the first step is you look at Rosetta code to find what the hell is the algorithm. And the algorithm is very simple. You know, you go from the half of the array, you go all the way down, and you make little heaps on the way. Shift down. And shift down is, of course, the inner loop. And it turns out it's pretty complicated. That's a lot of work. It's not three lines. So it turns out you're looking at five compares and jumps per element in the inner loop. And we have like uh, addition, shift, easy, assignments, and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so what is your next place to look? Where do you look for a good implementation of a make heap algorithm? Stack On Stack Overflow. <laughs> uh, maybe not. In the STL source, of course. Yes, in make heap, written by GNU. Actually, you can find a lot of good stuff. And this is intentional. It's a very small font, so I make fun of you, right? So it's like, oh, there must be some good stuff in there, but I will never be able to see that. Um, it turns out you can decipher that code. It kind of has all the double underscores leading every symbol and all that nonsense. But it turns out it's understandable. So once you get into what it means uh, to implement a, a make heap algorithm, uh, you read this and it kind of makes sense. You kind of have an understanding. And the way, it, uh, the way GNU heapify works is very interesting. Uh, it uses moves instead of swaps, but I didn't notice that makes a difference for primitive types. Uh, it's good for you know, user-defined types. Um, and it has a special case for the last leaf. Let me explain to you what that means. If my last leaf, so how many elements does this array have? Quick. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. If it had 10, I would have one node with no sibling. It would be an orphan, not an orphan, a siblingless, an or a spoiled only child, right? And it turns out that you need to test for that crap every time. So is this a heap with an uh, odd number of elements or an even number of elements? If it's even, we have this spoiled brat, and we got to look after this kid, right? I hate that kid, right? So it turns out it's a special case in the inner loop. In every iteration, the inner loop. So the GNU folks do something very clever. They said, you know what? Let's actually factor that out, the inner loop, and put in the outer loop. So they kind of have this uh, special case. If you squint real bad, you're going to see something like uh, if 
len n1 is zero. There's an if there. I'm not sure. Do, do the last guy in the, you, do you see that? Oh yeah, yes, yes. Eagle eye, thank you. So, GNU actually uh, makes this a particular case that uh, takes it out of the inner loop. So that's pretty neat. It turns out it can be, uh, we, can, we can do even better. It turns out in the inner loop of GNU, we have two comparing jumps, four arithmetic and two assignments. And here's my idea. I'm going to only hippify the simple case and the spoiled brat, I'm going to insert it at, into the heap at the very end with log and operations. Turns out this was a winner. Let's take a look. Insertion sort heap. So this is my whole insertion algorithm. And it goes, well, uh, we're going to first look at the particular case of size less than three. If size is less than three, I'm going to have a simple case which is sort to elements only. And notice again the same pattern, friends. You see this? This is conditional as arithmetic. If the size is two, that's going to be one. So I'm going to swap zero and one. I'm going to compare and swap zero and one. If size is not two, I'm going to compare and swap zero and zero, which is a no-op. It's not going to do anything. It turns out this is fastest you know, upon measurements. So again, try to integrate logic into your arithmetic, like make Make your logic an integer and work with it, right? An integer that can be 0, 1, and then you know, work with that guy. So that's lesson number one. And uh, then we have like um, heapify and unguarded insertion sort as we talked. And let's look at heapify. Heapify is pretty neat. I'm going to detail the inner loop in a minute. So we have uh, the inner loop here. And then we have this. The last six lines of code are the spoiled brat the childless, right? Another pattern in efficient code, early returns. If size is odd, return. That means the whole portion of code after that is not even loaded in the innermost eye cache, right? So in all that uh, SCSC, single entry, single exit, that's crap. Your functions should have a single entry point, but they should exit as fast as, you know, as fast as you can just get out of there. This is like a good efficiency tip. As soon as, you're, as soon as you make a conclusion, just get the hell out of there. Return. Right? Very, very often the compiler does arrange your code like that, but number one, it looks crappy on the page. If, else, 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 that kind of stuff, right? No, if whatever, return, get the hell out of there. And then if something else, return, get the hell out of there. And then the main bodies, right, the special case is uh, in plain. So this is the case here. We try to return as fast as possible, but if not, we're going to do, this is, the, this is a manual insertion of the last node, the last uh, loop there. And let's look at the inner loop. And the inner loop turns out to be very, very efficient. So I'm going to go with the right kid, and again, the same pattern, damn it. Look at this guy, const auto, best kid equals right kid minus condition. So it's right kid minus zero or right kid minus one, depending on when I want to go in the heap, so in the heapifying routine. Do I want to go left or do I want to go right? And I choose left or right depending on a condition without doing an if. It turns out compilers don't do this for you. They just, sometimes they do, very, you know, very unexpectedly. But if you write it like that, they're never going to insert a branch for you. Right? So this is, again, like the best pattern. This doesn't even count. It's so fast, it can be done in parallel because it's just a flag. It can be done in parallel with other arithmetic. So that's pretty awesome. And then we have a comparison that's going to get me uh, out of the inner loop. And then do a swap and that kind of stuff and follow. Another efficiency tip. You, know, you see this loop here is an infinite loop. Infinite loop. Turns out infinite loops are the best way to write fast code. I'm not kidding. Like, 
if you want to write fast code, your first, the first thing you put on the, on, the, on the paper, the first thing you put there is like a four semicolon, semicolon, and you open a brace. That means, you know what that means? It's a jump at the, to, you know, from the end to the beginning of the thing. That's it. I noticed I interviewed for Facebook like uh, hundreds of people. Literally, I interviewed hundreds of people. My first question was implement STR, STR. Brute force, but don't, don't do anything extra. Like, don't, you know, don't be inefficient. And, a lot, you know, half of the people, they would use uh, Esther Sterling in a loop. Like they say, four, you know, I int i equals zero, i less than Sterling of, oh my goodness. So you're going to do an O of n operation in a loop. So, okay, and then, and then they say, oh, sorry. I'm going to factor S Sterling out, and I'm going to initialize a variable with it, and they thought they're good. No, that's not good. You, get, you don't need to compute Sterling. You start with an int, because everybody wants to start with a structured loop. They want to have for i equals zero, i less than something, i plus plus. Yes, this is the right way to write. No. <laughs> not, no. The fact that it's a structured loop should come after you've done the infinite loop and you look at the code and you say, yes, this could be rewritten as a structured loop. You never start with a structured loop and then figure out, oh, this could be a lot better. If, no, it doesn't work that way. The same, it doesn't work. If you want to buy a good car, don't buy a bad car first, OK? If you buy a you know, Ferrari, you can drive 20 miles an hour, or 20, you know, 30 kilometers. A Ferrari can drive slow. Do you agree? Right? But the, you know, a Trabant cannot drive fast. Do you have a Trabant in Italy right now? Is there like, it's forbidden, right? <laughs> OK. By the same token, Structured loops for unstructured work should be forbidden. Fast code means infinite loops, friends. I'm not sure how convincing I was here because <laughs> it's a contradiction in terms. Infinite loops take quite a bit of time. All right, so I have um, uh, two things. So I start with an infinite loop. I you know, arrange my, my way through. I use logic as part, part of my normal arithmetic. And it turns out this is fast. Turns out I do only two comparisons with branching and two, a, a, bit, a few more operations and let's, uh, let's, make a, let's take a look. So I tested and it turns out we're not yet there. 2% slower. But then you remember now we have fewer comparisons, fewer swaps, so you can increase the threshold and get the same number of comparisons, same number of swaps, but overall better time. Remember, try silly things. And indeed, if we uh, double the threshold, we take it to 64, it turns out you have a 3% net win. And 3% turns out the sorting is good. And I'll, I'll let you know why. Sorting is not a high margin business. Never there's going to be a sorting that's like two times better than everybody. Because there's the informational theoretic limits. And we're within 10% of the theoretical limit. So th the best we can ever get is 10%, like by the law. <laughs> right? So, you know, 3% is a lot. It's very nice. It's very good and it can make a difference because there's a lot of algorithms that have sorting as the bottleneck. So that's nice, but you know, it's not spectacular, but it's nice. But give me a second because there is something spectacular coming. <laughs> After this talk, I interviewed a few of you. And you told me this. I'm coming from the future. <laughs> and you, tell, you told me, well, you know, at this point, it went completely off the rails. Like when you start undressing and taking your jeans off, that was like out there. That was terrible. OK, not, not going to happen, OK? But something similar is going to happen. Something similar is going to happen. So let's lay, uh, take a look at some figures here. So we have comparisons with uh, threshold. And as you expect, re remember quadratic. quadratic Parabola, right? Parabolic, very nice. So 
it goes like that, very beautiful. So I expect like things to go, you know, a bit worse with uh, increasing of the threshold. So we have like threshold 512 already is pretty bad. Uh, baseline is in red, that's insertion sort. And the blue, which is quite a bit better, is actually the heap plus insertion. So it turns out my stupid idea kind of pays off. It was, it was nice, right? So then we have moves. And that also goes quadratically as expected. Very nice. Cool, cool. No problem here. Move on. But the time, the time, my friends, the time goes down as comparisons and swaps go up. So right now we have the stupidity, you know, like George, George Costanza, finally my stupidity pays off. I'm doing more comparisons, more swaps, and better time. So th because I had the rig there. So I was like, OK, so I got 3%. This is kind of reportable. It's something that I can, I can tell people with a straight face, it's a positive step forward for humankind, no matter how small. Right? But it's 3% that's a positive. And then I said, well, I have the rig here. I could just change the numbers and see what the hell happens. No matter how stupid it is. So I increased the threshold to 64. And then I said, what the hell? Let's make it 128 and let's make it 256 all the way to whatever. So from here, it gets worse. But here, it turns out it's a sweet spot for heap and insertion sort. It turns out, even though we have 45% more comparisons, and two times almost more swaps, we are doing 6% better in time, getting dangerously close to the informational theoretical limit. So this is amazing I, on so many levels, right? You can tell this went off the rails, right, friends? You can tell. This is like completely what the, I, I, by the way, this is it. I don't have any more material. I don't have an explanation for what's happening. I, I can't tell you why. I'm very honest here. I have no idea why this happens. But I have a hypothesis. Remember the Chinese immigrants? <laughs> I have a hypothesis. And my hypothesis is the following. How about I look at the average distance between two subsequent array accesses? So whenever you read from the array or you write to the array, that's an array access, right? And you can encapsulate that and think of it as the array is here and the algorithm is here. And whenever you access an, the array, you remember the last axis. So then you measure the distance between two successive array accesses. And the hypothesis is, let's call it the Chinese immigrant hypothesis, OK? Is the following. Maybe, just maybe, if the distance is large, then the algorithm is not very good. Because cash, yada, yada, right? <laughs> cash, things. right? So if the distance is too large, maybe it's not very good. If the distance is small, the algorithm is more cash friendly. So I have a metric that I can look at. And it turns out, yes, that average distance does decrease and is correlated with the time. So you have comparisons, you have swaps, and you have the average distance between accesses. And it turns out those two comparison swaps, as we measured many times in this talk, they're just not enough for, for describing what the hell happens. So then I propose this distance as, well, this is a metric that could be useful. I don't have a lot of evidence to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, you know, to uh, sustain that, but you know, it's a reality that the less of a distance I have, uh, sorry, the, the larger threshold I have, the better the time, and for a good amount, uh, we have a much less distance to spend. And by the way, I'm looking here at um, tens of thousands of um, elements. So on average, quicksort with heap insertion, whatever, is going to do about, um, in the best case, is going to do about 20, sorry, some 17,000, the average distance between tracks is 17,000, right? Which is kind of an interesting piece. 
an interesting tidbit of information. Summary. We are witnessing a very odd era, a very bizarre epoch in computing, where the book, you can throw it. You gotta look at not even research in sort of the very specialized research that is a kind of on you know uh, information theory and uh, branch prediction and uh, cache oblivion algorithms and uh, data structures and that kind of stuff. So you gotta look at like odd research, obscure research to figure out what the hell to do to write fast software. I can't emphasize this enough. Try silly things. Whatever sticks on the wall, just try it, see what the hell happens. Right? Measure everything. So once you have the rig to measure things, you're going to be in good shape. Devise and track meaningful metrics, like this distance here, which is the only, pretty much the only thing I have to go on on uh, explaining this, uh, this result. You've been awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have one more thing to say. So we started ahead of the schedule, which must be like the first ever time in Italy that ever happened, right? <laughs> so, like, so we kind of ended on schedule, uh, kind of ahead of the schedule. Um, I got to tell you a story about uh, Rafael and, and myself, which kind of illustrates our friendship and, uh, and my affinity to, uh, to you guys. It goes the following way. Rafael and I were meant to meet at 8 p.m. in a piazza, right? in uh, Genova. So I'm late five minutes. And I'm, I'm, I'm chronically late. I have a, like a condition almost, like it's a weird. I'm, I'm always late, so I'm late five minutes and I'm kind of sweating and kind of desperate, like, oh my goodness, I'm mortified. What's this guy gonna say about me? So I'm, I'm there like uh, 8.05 and, uh, <laughs> and Rafael is not there. <laughs> he comes another like seven minutes after that and he doesn't mention it. And he's like, hi. Like, <laughs> yeah, good to see you. At that point, like two things happened. Number one, our friendship like took a whole different level. Like our relationship <laughs> was like so much more awesome. Like, you know, in a platonic way, we're, we're happily married, but you know, it went like very good friendship. And second, like, us, I'm home, baby. <laughs> I'm home. This is my country. This is awesome. This is where I want to be. So I can take questions uh, if you have any. Please. There's microphones. Please. Just curious. Did you measure just on the x86 or on other architecture? This, uh, Only on Intel. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, it's a very relevant. Only on Intel. Okay. Nothing else. Across, uh, it turns out that across very different Intel architectures, uh, like this laptop, a big iron machine, uh, Xeon, Xenon, whatever, so it, um, the results are portable in a way. Oh, uh, nice but, one. Um, I should add that on ARM, the branch predictor is not all that good at all. Yeah. So there is, these results might, might be different. Yeah, um, I, I was expecting on ARM uh, the, the perfetching sites to be quite relevant in uh, probably in the opposite right. direction. I mean, because the, given the ARM, as far as I remember correctly, the prefetching doesn't work in two cache lines. The, the threshold, uh, I was thinking, was cited in order to get uh, exactly that site. Um, definitely. So uh, allow me to kind of take that question and transform it into the question I wanted to get. <laughs> that is like oh, the best. sorry. Um, so the, the comment was, well, on ARM, there will be a different dynamics. Uh, the prefetching is different. Uh, branch prediction is different, much worse. Uh, pipeline depth is uh, less, right, smaller, right, shorter pipelines. So the results are likely to be different. And that takes us to the notion, like, maybe I want to tune the algorithm for the target CPU, which is a very reasonable thing to do, and also, like, that threshold, at least. And uh, the second thing is, 
uh, you want to uh, tune that threshold depending on the data you work on. Everything we talked about is double because everybody in the research world does double. In the real world, maybe you have like a struct customer and you want to sort customers or you know things with uh, user-defined copy constructor, user-defined move constructor, user-defined comparison operator, you know, that kind of stuff. So for these kind of types, you want to do some sort of an introspection into the type that you're working with and make decisions on algorithm selection depending on the type. For example, who knows about has trivial swap? Has trivial move constructor? Has trivial whatever. So these are new to C++, coming from C++ 17. So there's, there are introspection primitives that cannot be implemented in user code. You can't sit down and implement it portably. There's no way. It uses inside information from the compiler. The compiler can tell you, oh, this type has a trivial move, uh, kind of move constructor. And if it's trivial, the cost of moving elements around is strictly proportional to size of, thank you very much. So it's like a very simple constant. It, to move, you move the memory. This is it, right? So for those, you choose the threshold as uh, inverse proportion to the size of the type. So then, unfortunately, there's no uh, has trivial uh, less than, right? There's no such thing. But you can still say if it's a primitive type, int, all integers, all floating point types, pointers, what have you, right? With uh, the default comparison, then you specialize your algorithm for that. You do this kind of stuff, which is fastest for primitive types, right? And if it's user defined, maybe you say, well, you know what? Maybe I don't want to run too many comparisons, too many swaps, because they're user defined, so they're arbitrarily slow. So you go with the traditional, like, uh, let's minimize the comparison swaps. So, um, Yes, to uh, sort of um, tie down the answer of, uh, to the question is you got to do some algorithm selection based on the target arch architecture and based on the target type. And this is offline. That's the beauty of it. You don't need to slow down the algorithm to take measurements online. You just do it. It's free. Right? You just have to sit down and, you know, with your mind. Yeah, speed is fine in mind of people, right? Yes, please. So the improvements to make heap are quite clever. Are you planning to upstream them? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I assume you talk about GNU? Uh, no. I actually work at Facebook. <laughs> All right. Hi, Facebook. Yes, please. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'll be happy to make the code available to anybody who wants it. It's research code, so it looks terrible, but it's, uh, it kind of runs fast. Um, you stated at one point that uh, one property of the heap we actually explicitly use is just that special sentinel value at the beginning. Um, have you tried measuring just doing that, finding the maximum value, swapping it to the beginning, and uh, then doing the unguarded insertion set? Uh, have I measured just computing a minimum Take into the beginning and uh, yeah, exactly. yes, it's slower. Okay. Yeah. So all all forms of kind of selection sort like you know let me choose the minimum first, uh, and I'll tell you why. Um, where was I? Yeah, right. Uh, heap. Okay. I'm garden insertion sort. I'm going to do something very risky right now. I'm going to show my code. <laughs> okay. Ugh. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Microsoft, Visual Studio Code. OK. Huh. Even this works. Oh, this is the slides. Sorry. OK. Second, you guys, don't 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 leave on me, okay? Don't leave. That coffee can wait. Toilet can wait. Give me one more second. One more second. I don't have my glasses. I have an excuse. 
Okay, there we go. Um, let me make it bigger. So it turns out that um, insertion makes uh, already an, a neat trick, which is the following. Um, this else corresponds to the if above it. And it's testing for, am I smaller than the first element? Like, before trying anything, it's going to look at the element to be inserted. Am I smaller than the very first element? And if so, it's going to move everything like that and put this guy here. And otherwise, this guy is greater than the smallest element, so it can do unguarded. And this is my unguarded run. So that, in a way, it's already integrated in the smarts of the algorithm. This is from GNU. GNU. It's not mine. So GNU kind of does that by default. So in a way, GNU kind of already does that trick. Whenever, it's, uh, whenever you have this uh, uh, case in which, the worst case in which the elementary insert is the smallest of, uh, the smaller than the smallest, it just does the particular case. And otherwise, it just runs unguarded uh, insertion. So in a way, that's already inter There's a lot of smarts that uh, these STL implementers do. Uh, I was very pleasantly impressed. Last question. Oh, don't, don't let me hang in here. Yes, thank you. I'm just wondering if the increase of the operations has an impact on power consumption, even though the time is low, A is faster. Does the increase in operation have an impact on power consumption? Well, prima facie, I didn't measure that. So I, I couldn't tell you exactly. But I can speculate a number of things. Um, and the first thing is the most, uh, the worst uh, power consumers are failed speculations. When I speculate and fail, that's bad, right? So in a way, sort of more predictable, the simpler things work. Um, and the, the second comment is um, generally, if your thing runs faster, it's going to take less power. Uh, so um, time is a good proxy for speed. So I, I would say, for power consumption. So I would say that uh, actually, uh, the, the more you reduce the time, you complete the task faster. So in a way, you, 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 and also you're using the silicon better. Because there's a lot of um, okay de hardware details coming. It was at this point where the talk got really, really weird. So hardware details. You should know that 30% of the power in a CPU goes in the clock. Like just maintaining the clock, keeping it ticking, is 30% of the, the power consumption. It's just a lot of work just kind of propagating the clock and make sure it has the right edges and all that stuff. So even though you're not using the whole silicon uh, for a number of cycles, that th those portions still need to be kind of ticking. So uh, by that measure, the more you use the silicon every cycle, the more parallel you are, the better you're going to use your power. All right. Uh, that was the last question. I'll still be here for the day. I can't tell you just how much I appreciate. This was my first talk here. I'm not a virgin anymore. Thank you so very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.